Hello and welcome to Showcase, coming to you from our studios in Istanbul. Later on our program, we'll look at how this city is heralding in the return of spring with a series of new ballets. And speaking of series, 15 years after Friends officially went off the air, we'll tell you how it's making new friends across the world. And we'll also show you how you can literally take a walk through and experience one of the most iconic images ever painted on canvas. But first... A wooden water tower, a nature reserve and a micro library with walls covered in recycled ice cream tubs. We take a look at some of the projects competing for this year's fiercely contested Arhan Award for Architecture. Turning the camera on Andy Warhol, a man considered to exist in the same realm of fame as Picasso, comes to life in the photographs of Nett Finkelstein. in the 1960s. It was a time of untamed expression and experimentation when Andy Warhol and the rest of his pop art scene celebrities ruled the city. In 1964, Warhol opened the Silver Factory, a hub of creativity that was shrouded in mystery. Photographer Nett Finkelstein spent years photographing what happened in there. And now an exhibition of his photographs is lifting the lid on a never before seen side of the infamous factory. Showcase's Miranda Atti tells us what he found. The central London Proud Gallery is paying homage to Andy Warhol through the photography of one man. The late Nat Finkelstein, who died a decade ago, took hundreds of photos of Warhol and co between 1964 and 1967. Nat started his career actually at Harper's Bazaar where he undertook an internship and then he had uh, supplied photographs for publications such as Life magazine or Sports magazine Illustrated and then he um, got a commission from Pageant magazine and that enabled him to meet Andy and sort of it got him into the silver factory and he stayed there for three years as an in-house photographer. Finkelstein called himself a situational photographer and that's exactly what made his images of Warhol and crew so special. He wasn't the only photographer to spend years documenting what went on in the silver factory, but what he captured were the unposed intimate moments that offer a never before seen insight into some of America's most famous contemporary artists. Finkelstein photographed Warhol alongside musicians like Bob Dylan. According to rumors, it's whispered that Warhol gifted Dylan this double Elvis painting, which he later swapped with his manager for a sofa. The Elvis painting is now worth an estimated $30 million. Finkelstein managed to capture many candid moments like this. I think the way he was taking photographs so intimately, um, he was often very close to the subject and that really helped get this sort of gritty, candid feel. Although Finkelstein took hundreds of photos in the three years he spent as in-house photographer, not all have survived. Unfortunately, Nat is no longer with us. So for the past 10 years, his wife Elizabeth has been running his estate and a lot of the negatives um, weren't kept in you know, good condition, so a lot have been lost, a lot damaged. And so we're actually left with quite a small uh, collection of work. And a lot of the images are unique. During his time at the Silver Factory, 
Finkelstein photographed model Edie Sedgwick, the Velvet Underground and Warhol many times. The factory was not just a studio, it was an incubator for the underground art scene. And judging by Finkelstein's photos, it was also a lot of fun. Nat Finkelstein, in and out of Warhol's orbit, is on show at Proud Central until June the 11th. Miranda Atty, TRT World, London. The shortlist of 20 projects has been announced for one of the world's most respected design awards, the Arahan Award for Architecture. Founded in 1977 by Arahan IV, the award is given every three years to projects that successfully address the needs and aspirations of primarily Islamic societies. The categories include contemporary design, social housing and restoration, to name just a few. And this year's shortlist, chosen from an impressive list of international entrants, includes a project from Turkey. Istanbul's Bayezid State Library renovation is among the projects now undergoing meticulous inspections by a team of experts. Other contenders for the $1 million grant prize include the Taman Bima Microlibrary in Bandung, Indonesia. Made from recycled ice cream tubs, the community library aims to help combat Indonesia's low literacy rates. Other projects include a sustainably constructed museum in Birsait, Ramallah, the Mutraf fish market in Muscat, Oman, which highlights the region's trade and fishing traditions, and the Warka water tower in Ethiopia, which transforms humidity in the air into drinking water. How has the Islamic world been doing lately when it comes to architecture? Is it successful in preserving its cultural heritage? To answer these and talk us through the shortlist is the director of Aachen Award for Architecture, Feru Darakshani. Feru, great to have you with us today. So let me start with this. There is a candidate from Istanbul this year, which is where I'm talking to you from. So tell me about the Bayezid Library Project. The Bayezid Library Project is, uh, first of all, historically is very important because being the first public uh, library in Turkey, but what's in the Islamic world actually, but what is important is the work that has been done. So it's the Tawan Yolgi architects. What they've done is have brought new elements to the architecture and the restored building. So by this, they've made it a more public space, more pleasant for the users. And that's how apparently all these students are coming there all the time. Yeah, it is really crowded. I can affirm that. And uh, there is another library in the list, Taman Bima Micro Library from Indonesia. Tell me about that project as well, please. Well, that is the very opposite uh, uh, of the Hidesh Historic Library, this is a neighborhood library. And the whole thing is that the way that people live in Indonesia is very different to the way, uh, lifestyle of the people in Istanbul because of its climate. So public spaces and open spaces are very important. And in the city of Bandung, they've created this public space, which on top of it, there is a library. And these are a series of these libraries which are going to be built in, in the other cities as well. And they have used these architects, they have used uh, uh, the buckets, as you say, the ice, uh, ice cream buckets, as an element in the, uh, which is an innovative way to use things. I mean, speaking of the architectural culture of the Islamic world, um, your departure point in 1977, I think, was the concern that architectural heritage of the Islamic world is endangered. But that was 42 years ago. What do you think has changed? Did anything change? How is the Islamic world doing about it at the moment? Well, um, there is, as, as one can say, that there is an understanding maybe in the 19th, after the World War II, in the 1950s and 60s, there was a rapid modernization and people were not that much concerned about their roots, about their culture. So whatever was just blindly, they were copying whatever is kind of in being uh, copying to them. It's not only the Islamic world. It was that was the whole all around the world was the same uh, attitude. But now we have got more understanding. And what the award has been con has contributed in those years is to tell the people that you have a heritage and one has to look at it as an asset. It's not to copy it. It's not to just uh, repeat the same thing. But you have to learn from that and go for and add something for the future.
And also, I know that Arham the Fourth and the Award for Architecture is very concerned about modernization and globalization and urbanization in the Islamic world. So in that sense, I wonder, I mean, about the three projects, please correct me if I'm wrong, three projects that made it to the shortlist from Emirates, United Arab Emirates. What do you think about the Emirati approach in arch architecture and how does it contribute to the Islamic heritage of architecture? There's nothing called Islamic architecture heritage as, mm -hmm. as one style. So it is a variety, it's different approaches. Now, coming back to the em Emirates, uh, there was a rapid period of development and change in the Emirates. So it went very fast because there was not that much, it's not comparing to Istanbul, Turkey, or to uh, the Levant or other places. It's, it doesn't have the same architectural heritage uh, that the other countries had because it was not urban enough. The three projects which are in the Emirates, in this cycle, you, if you go through them, they're very interesting, each of them. First of all, it's about their scale, about their approach. The project that is about concerned about environmental uh, issues, which is done by local architects who have been trained in the United Arab Emirates. That is very important, the, the Wasit project. Uh, you've got the conservation and restoration project, which is done in, um, in Sharjah for the Biennale, which is one of the most advanced Biennales in the uh, art Biennales in the world. And thirdly, you've got the reusing of a, uh, of a contemporary heritage, let's call it, which are the how a famous architect, Ram Kolas, and his uh, office has turned some warehouses into um, culture center. And so these are all different approaches. They're very different from the some of the maybe size skyscrapers that may, you may be meaning that what is happening in the Arab Emirates. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Islamic heritage is definitely varied and versatile, but I still can't help wondering what kind of a legacy the Gulf approach in architecture these days will leave on future generations. Thank you so much for joining us on Showcase today. Çok teşekkür. Still to come on Showcase, celebrating the changing of the seasons. Welcoming the spring. That's what Turkey's state opera and ballet theatre is doing with not one, but a medley of ballets. Seeing is believing. Step into the world of a painting, literally, and take a walk on a beach with a monk. There is a feeling of nostalgia when it comes to autumn, the calm that comes following a hot summer, the reprieve that happens before winter. But of course, the cycle is incomplete without the spring, known as a time of rebirth and revival. Here in Istanbul, spring is in full bloom, something that Turkey's state opera and ballet's newest production is capturing. One show and a medley of ballets. Turkey State Opera and Ballet presents these three one-act ballets in a new production, Spring, Knox and Four Seasons. Out of the three, Spring and Knox had their world premieres, and Four Seasons, a critic and fan favorite, has been running for two years already. Their connecting theme is that they're all about the spring. Knox, for instance, finds the spring as a time for renewal, and asks if humanity had a chance to start again, would we still try to selfishly rule the world instead of being a part of it in peace? While spring requires a certain mindset to be able to fully merge into its sensational world. I think you have to be open. You have to be just open and see and be free to put your own creativity, to put your own fantasy into it. And from there on, anything, it is right. There is no such wrong or right. So your story is the story. You have to imagine that we have a body. The dancers have, they have their body. And we already from there on, we understand so much. And this is the secret. 
This is Dan's first time collaborating with the state opera and ballet. And Spring, which he choreographed, had just three weeks of rehearsal before the premiere. So it was just like the sudden coming of Spring. The first time, like, doing a step in the studio, the dancers, they were, you know, interested. They were open for new things. They tried. They, they you know, they didn't thought much about it. They just gave themselves into it and I really, really enjoyed working with them. Of course, the preparation process is much harder because it's your first time performing a part. So it takes time to get comfortable in your skin physically, but also mentally. It's the sheer joy of life, that joie de vivre, that keeps the show go on. And there is a simple recipe for that. Let's, let's put it that way, you know, like if you move, you're happy because it is a chemical reaction in your body, in your brain. I mean, ask doctors or something, they, they will tell you the details. But this is it, you know, like as soon as you move, you're actually happy. The three ballets will take the stage throughout May at Istanbul's Kadıköy Süreya Opera House. Sena Arslan, TRT World, Istanbul. Imagine pitching a show to a TV executive about six 20-something, mostly unemployed friends who hang out in a coffee shop. Well, that premise went on to become the global phenomenon known as Friends. The show aired during an era when people huddled around their TV each week to catch the latest episode. But 15 years after it went off the air, the show has found a new home on Netflix, who paid $100 million to air the series for the next year. A good investment, seeing it was their second most streamed show of 2018. You don't want to see this, do you? Hell yeah! Let's go back to when it all started. The year was 1994 and the technology was not as 8-bit as this intro, but compared to the quality now, it may seem that way. <laughs> Almost pre-internet, people actually had to watch the show when it was broadcast. No binging possible. My God. Yeah. Shut up! Shut up! Shut up! <laughs> Before Friends came along, most group ensemble sitcoms were largely centered around adults and family life. Instead, Friends actually focused on Friends filmed in front of a live audience. It told stories of a younger generation humorously navigating their way through life, love, and careers. And I just want a million dollars. How you doing? How you doing? The impact of the show on popular culture, from Joey's How You Doing, to Phoebe's smelly cat song and the iconic Rachel hairstyle came immediately. It was also one of the first times an ensemble cast fought for and received equal pay, with all six earning a million dollars per episode in the last two seasons, a reflection of the massive audience the show has managed to attract. What? Mother, God is true. And my personal opinion is that uh, the characters are kind of archetypes and that we all know people like these characters and they're relatable, we can relate to their foibles and their, you know, their failures and their successes and their loves and losses and things like that. And now there's a new generation of fans, so it's a bit timeless, you know, it's not, it was shot in the 90s, but it's not like necessarily a 90s show, except for maybe the fashion and the hairstyles. New viewers have commented on the fact that the relatable situations in light comedy are pure escapism that it's a show with a high feel-good factor set in an ideal, more simple world where nothing terrible happens, everything works out in the end, and your friends are always there for you. So happy. <laughs> the outfits might be dated, but the story still manages to keep a whole new generation glued to their TV screens. More than two decades after the much-loved sitcom first hit our screens, I have TV critic Kelsey Miller, author of I'll Be There For You. Thank you so much for joining us on Showcase today. I mean, let's start with this. 
at its heart, this show is about um, privileged, white, young adults living in one of the most expensive cities on earth. And they don't really have, uh, well, problems or any cares really. So how is it relatable as many people said? I do think at its heart, this is a show about friendship and, you know, underneath all of the appearances, that is ultimately the sort of core. And that is what makes the show relatable, I think, because it is, as the creators described it, a show about the time in your life when your friends are your family. I mean, TV sitcoms usually just come and go and only a few linger for some time. And this lasted for 10 years. So what, what do you think is the X factor about friends? Oh well, gosh, it's so many things. I mean, first of all, one thing that just doesn't get talked about quite as much is the fact that the writing is so spectacular. I mean, it's a very, very well created and conceived of and produced and written show. Everybody working behind the scenes was just, you know, top of their game and very, very good. And then you have this cast who is not, you know, they're not only very good, you know, comedic performers, but they also, they share a kind of, um, they, they really speak the same language in terms of comedy, so they work together very well. And as everybody has said about the show, it was like lightning in a bottle. They had this sort of magic chemistry. And I think that that really gives an aliveness to the show. Mm -hmm. And it was actually recorded in front of a live audience, right? Why was that? Yeah, you know, I think that that was something that was particularly important to the producers of Friends because they would actually rely on the audience to tell them whether or not the material was working, which of course everybody does to some degree, but they would listen and see, okay, is, is the loud not laugh enough? Uh, is the laugh not loud enough? And they, if not, they would stop production and they would rewrite on the spot and they would keep going until the laugh got bigger and bigger enough for them. They really, really depended on the audience. Mm -hmm. But Kelsey, I mean, this show was criticized heavily for its lack of diversity. What do you think about that? Despite this, why was it so relatable? I think it's the criticism is absolutely spot on. And that's something that I get into pretty in depth in my book. I, one of the reasons I wanted to write it was because I wanted to tackle those topics in a, in a, in a book which gives you a lot more sort of room for nuance and for in-depth discussion. Uh, rather than just, you know, a hot take or a reaction. Um, so I think that that is all very valid criticism. I mean, this is a show that takes place in the middle of New York City, one of the most diverse cities in the world. And it's, you know, ent entirely populated by white people. <laughs> and uh, very quickly before we wrap up, do you think there's going to be a reboot or a special soon? You know, it's a little bit hard to say uh, because we do have the 25th anniversary of the show's debut coming up in September. And I would be very surprised if they didn't do something, you know, to mark that occasion. Mm -hmm. That said, I think it's very unlikely that you'll see this show brought back, if only for logistical reasons. But I do think that's a good thing because this is a show about a, about a very particular sort of time in life. And for these characters, that time has long since passed. Yes. And I do think it would kind of spoil it, you know? Yes, I think we should sure. enjoy the reruns. They're great. Kelsey Miller, TV critic. We'll have to wait and see. I guess thank you so much for joining us on Showcase today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining us. And if you're looking for more of Showcase's coverage of the global art scene, you can find it on our YouTube channel. But before we go, let's revisit Wanderer Above the Sea of Fog. This iconic painting, which you can see here, is by 19th century romantic painter Kaspar David Friedrich, considered the most important German artist of his generation. Recent restoration on his paintings have revealed many of his unknown techniques. And now an exhibition in Berlin has combined these discoveries with virtual reality to show visitors what it feels like to literally walk into the world of a painting. Amelie Fereketli, until next time, bye for now.